Conversational commerce expert. That, that doesn't slip off the tongue. I need to get a badge. You do need to get a badge, yeah. yeah. And, and teach me about pronouncing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Lee, who you can't see, very well here. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Hello, Lee. Hello. A bit shy. Yeah. <laughs> he's the youngest yeah. of the group. <laughs> or he's not supposed to be here. Or he's probably yeah. not supposed to be here. <laughs> You're just trying to make it tough. They keep me out at night. So, Lee, obviously, you've got your own software development company. And uh, very exciting for all. So, um, okay, so uh, did, did you actually listen on audio to the book? Yes, I did. You did? I was oh, just right. going to say, I'm on chapters. There's a ridiculous number of chapters. There's loads of chapters. <laughs> okay. Chapter 40, Where, how come I'm on chapter 40? I don't know how come you're on chapter 40. It ends in chapter 37. <laughs> 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 so, here's the funny thing. So, yeah. this book. It, 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 it's a bit of a slap in the face for your conventional, the secret. Do you know what I mean? Where, oh yeah, think and everything will just happen. Um, but he's a big advocate. The guy's called Keith Herring. But I've got your books in the car. So afterwards, we'll go get it right. We've got a little backlog. Very <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you know, like I've got you. Up. So the problem I had with this book, by the way, is that. I had the book, and I read the book, and I had it on audio as well, so I've been running, pounding in the streets with my headphones on, walking, <laughs> my headphones on, listening to the book as well. Um, and the, the great thing is, this guy is just slapping your face practical. He's not kind of, he, there's no mystic, there's no magic, there's no kind of, um, you, know, you think and you envision it and it will happen. No, he's lost millions. Uh, and, uh, and he calls it the road less stupid because what he says is life is tough, but it's much tougher when you're stupid. <laughs> that's one of the opening so lines in this book. And I thought that's brilliant. And he says that the, the, the whole problem with being with the, in life and business is that if you're stupid, you get struck with the dumb tax. And the dumb tax is a totally voluntary tax that can just be laid on you whenever. And I just thought that was just brilliant. It's really good. So it's really refreshing. But the problem I've got with it is I've got, I've got the hardback of this. I went to order it for everybody else. And uh, it's importable from the United States. Only. Oh, so you get the dumb tax. So I got the dumb tax. I got the dumb tax. Yeah, you can buy it online. I made an assumption that you can buy it in the UK. You can't. However, you can get it on Amazon. And Lee will have the only copy in the UK. Wow. Do you know what I mean? That's your prize for coming tonight. You know, I'd like to congratulate. Here's, here's a good thing. I've been working with Lee for a while now. We've been working together for more than a year, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, um, you, yeah, it's not a criticism, but on, on occasion you go dark, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't get hold of him. I try every medium, my email, my ping in, my texting. I, I, I Always at the right time. I wait outside his house, do you know what I mean? Snapchat, you're trying to get out of the house. I'm trying to get out of the house. I'm waiting yeah. for a message on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is, so, so obviously you're away. Um, what he did today is he, first of all, he responded to my text message, which was brilliant. And he rang me up to tell me he was on his way. Wow. That's cool, isn't it? It's been communication. Uh, actually, okay. I'm, I'm, I've been a lot more organised. <laughs> <laughs> I really have. All my apps are in folders now. So, you know, that was big enough. You know. <laughs> That's a big change, isn't it? No, it's just, just trying to get everything. Yeah. It's, it's, 
It's amazing that since every time we're organised, like, it seems to be able to get more done. <laughs> that is a bizarre, you know what? There seems to be less to do. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about that, haven't we? Yeah. I've really been working on it last few months. Profit multiplier, bro. Great to see you quite well, actually. Um, so, yeah. Lee's on the profit multiplier program, and it's 12, I don't need to explain it to you, but I'm telling you, these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm telling you, 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 I'm this is the book, no, the, the road less due to the one when you're ready. I, I said if, I'm, if you I'm, can I'm, listen I'm to it. I'm on chapter 45, yeah, 55 chapters. Still going. <laughs> still going. Yeah, there's a lot of reading, a lot of listening, but it's really... Oh, hello, Peter. No, no, quick... Oh, the quick bit. It is, it is in the background, isn't it, Peter? This, one, this is not... There's no product placement in this in this video at all, Peter. We are at the Star and Garter. It's not great for... No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 they're at the Good Little Restaurant, actually. Quite like so, yeah, so the dumb tax is really, really quite interesting, isn't it? And, and there's some... He comes up with some just superb one-liners throughout the entire book that just made me chuckle. And I just thought, this guy, um, you know he's been there, you know he's done it, you know he's made the mistakes. And he's just trying to help us as business owners not make the same mistakes. And I think that's just brilliant. It's such a giving guy, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, where he says, passive income, seriously? So one of, the, one of his big blocks, he challenges. He said, well, the, the idea of passive in, is income. It doesn't work. You have to work. Well, that passive exercise. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It it says, if you think you can set up a business and walk away, every business has challenges. The environment is moving all the time. You've got to have your finger on the pulse as the CEO side owner of the business. And you can't just go away and expect, even if you put all the systems in place, Something will hit the fan and you'll need to go and go to work. It's, it's almost like a common sense person on your shoulder. It's just great, isn't it? It's full of real practical things. <laughs> What's his view on the making of it? So his view on making sense is you don't have time to make them all yourself. No. Trial and error. There's no time in business to do trial and error. Um, what you've got to do is learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah. And that's why he documents more than his books. So he needs to do research, is that what <laughs> he, 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 he has got an extensive <laughs> library of books. He reads three books a week or something. Yeah, it's a massive of lunch. He's obviously retired. <laughs> I can't, I got out of time. He's obviously got order one time too. He's got order one time too. So one of the things that he says here, he says um, the key to getting rich and staying rich um, is to make less to, to, is to is to make less stupid mistakes. Yeah? And, uh, and and also the thing is he one of the things he points out that is he doesn't make like an emotional decision. <laughs> The more emotional decision, the less intellect there is in that decision. And obviously, one of the keys to successful sales is to get through to people's emotions. So they make emotional decisions rather than intellectual ones, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and I think that's quite, quite clever, the same. And so he doesn't like the tooth fairy. Yeah? He doesn't believe in magic pills. I know this is hard to believe. He doesn't believe in secret formulas. Yeah. It just means something. And one of those classic phrases that he says is, "All balloons look good when filled with hot air." <laughs> and so, and you never come. I, I seem to be a target online now. So it's, uh, every ad says, because obviously they know I'm a business coach. Yeah. How to get six figure, uh, seven figure income in your coaching practice with no work. Get straight to the right clients, you know, don't have a sales phone, don't do all the hard stuff by social media and all that. We've got a magic formula that we're sharing with you today for just £95. It's worth £7,453, but we're going to give it to you today for £95. Wow. And now, so I'm going to share it with you. Are they on a the beach? Yeah. They're on a beach with a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, I get them as well, and the word coach has been swapped. Has it really? Yeah. And they're only working four hours a week. Yeah, because yeah. that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see that this week there was a big business that they 
They say it will it increases their productivity because they they're not stopping off work to do the things that they were going to do. Yeah, I bet I, mean, I bet seven and a half hours are definitely wasted per hour. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see whether. Those 30 hours will become more angry, sorry. No, that's right. Hey, no, no, let's, let's, let's talk about anything, because that's the idea of this, isn't it? But this book, I, this book and every chapter triggered so many thoughts in my head. I was like, I had to sit there. Have you really got millions of thoughts in your head? It really has. This guy, Owen. But there's, there's a classic chapter where he says that a, 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 an executive comes into a, a, a board meeting and says that um, here's the plan for a complete strategic rebrand. As in like 300k. That's it. The and, and, and he says, so just just confirm to me that you've done all the research behind this, and it is actually the fact that when they look at our product, it's at the right price, it's targeted to the right people, and it goes through all the things that you should have done to make sure you're selling into the exactly the right market of the niche. And the only thing stopping them is when they look up at the top of the, of the, of the website, they go, I'm not going to buy this because I don't like their logo. All and the their font size. <laughs> the schemes all wrong. And of course, that person hadn't done any of that work, and they end up spending, instead of 300,000, they spent 35k realigning things, and they went up to fit for two people. They almost doubled the business. And, and, and you just think, Every CEO should have this book of bedside reading. Because if they don't, they're going to miss a trick. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so that's because we, 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 we talk to our clients about a similar principle of like, We talk about business basics. So obviously, we, yeah, the, the stuff we're interested in is inspiring and exciting people. But when we go in, the first thing we say is great brand to build on business basics. Yeah. Is your distribution chain is, is your product performing at minimum at parity? Because mm -hmm. actually, it's incredibly hard to get a product, especially in like mainstream, that is very important. Very few people, like, in, if you go into a city, the two deodorants don't work better than They work as well. They have the same technology. So, yeah. I've just spotted we've got a 30th birthday party walking in. I hope you're not coming home and join us. Well, it'd be very well. So, yeah, no, 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 like, there's no point advertising a company. If you don't have business well, yeah, yeah. And one of you key... accelerate their doom, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you, you're amplifying rubbish. You're amplifying yeah. the cracks yeah. in everything we've got. Well, that's nice. I feel like I should uh, <laughs> <laughs> just so that they're aware of what's distracting us for a moment. <laughs> the balloons, the balloons, yeah. obviously. And, and like, one, one of the things he says is, what, why, do, why do you think, why do you feel your business needs to constantly try and get new customers? when it is so much easier to leverage money out of existing customers. I, 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 so, all, all businesses are resilient. So, so, every business is a leaky so you need the leads to get the, the number one indicator. And I, now I'm talking about like SMC. So it's, it's, I recognize if, if you are a smaller business with a list of 10 clients, maybe it's a little bit different. But the, the bigger businesses, the number one indicator of growth is acquisition. But, but the, pro the, the, the problem with that, so the number one indicator of growth is acquisition, and the number two indicator of growth is getting more out of the physical thing. And often what, like there's a, there's a book in our industry, it's the American book, uh, High Branch Growth. So it's only on the acquisition. So everyone's stuck on the acquisition and they ignore them. Yeah, and they just kind of, it's more like, grab them in, and that's bad to practice too, but like, yeah. uh, the life of the business is definitely too much. If you're not focusing on bringing this from the house, eventually that formula requires to figure out what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not constantly replenishing your clients. However, there's a lot of wasted yeah. yeah. potential. What is the lifetime value of that possible? Because there's no point in treating someone if the only thing you can sell is one thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mentioned that this is a hand where I only sell one thing, and that one thing killed the problem. And it's really rubbish. Yeah. Right. That's it. I do yeah. it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's that's it. It. My, my parents had a Bendix washing machine, they went bankrupt because our Bendix washing machine lasted until I left home. Wow, that's 40 years. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> it was ridiculous. It just kept going. That's mad. So, so I think we, I think they build in. Oh, they are like completely rude. So, um, one of the things that one of the amusing little sentences that, that Keith Harrington uses in his book, The Run Less Stupid, is this: "Running in the wrong direction enthusiastically won't lead to success." <laughs> By the way, the hand that you can see waving around is Gideon. He's, he's just off camera, right. and, and hopefully you can hear him talking. Because he's kind of talking to me, which is great. But that's because I, I like to hear what he says. And, and the chin, and the chin, yeah. the chin, <laughs> the chin is handsome Lee. We don't like him on picture. We like old people on there. He looks very ginger. <laughs> I might look like he's got even less hair than I actually have. Which is not nice. so okay. So here's the thing: is it in the road less stupid? What we talk about is actually thinking. Have you heard of a book called Think and Grow Rich? It's by Napoleon Hill. It's one of the classics. He says it's not just called Grow Rich. It's called Think and Grow Rich. And, and he's a massive advocate of actually just taking the time to think. In fact, what's he's he's at the end of every chapter? He says, You said this. You said this. He says, Now go think. Go think. You will thank me later. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of every chapter, he says, This is it on a bumper sticker. Now, I don't know. Yeah, we don't have bumper stickers, don't yeah. It's a little, a little breezy. Yeah, if it's, the one thing, if it's the one thing about the book, it's like every chapter there's at least two or three bumper stickers. Which I know is his, like, and here's the summary yeah, yeah. In, a, in, a, in a nutshell type of thing. Which is, so if you, you know, go to the UK, you, go, you can just have to replace that with a, with a, a more English phrase. So, you know, I'm ranting all over about working on your business and not in your business. Well, well he has issues with that. But that thinking part yeah. is working on your business. Yeah. That's, that's he said everybody oh, works yeah. in their business. Yes. If you're not working in your business, then you're not part of the business. Even as a CEO, you're not part of the business. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, she was like, so we were, we were she probably like 20, but she got to like 21. And uh, obviously started, had her own business and was doing this, that, and the other thing. And the, you know the guy who's kind of really solid, he's not, he's not, not obviously a main man. Uh, Alan Sugar, he's not, that's the one, not, not your boy, bro. Not Alan Sugar, but the other, what's the other guy's name? The tall guy. So he's got the woman. He's right hand man. Right hand man. He changed it recently. Yeah, I didn't realize it was so much. Oh, in case you've missed that entire thing. He's not the rat. It doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, him, that guy who's. We got the super right hand man. Just look at that right hand. It's still going funny. But he, he said to this woman, the dangerous thing about you is you don't know what you don't know. You're not aware. You're in that unconscious environment state where you think it's great. And, and, and so there is a thing about that, is that state is a, a state that a lot of people start their own businesses in. You know, they're in this job and they're sick and tired and, and they decide they might start their own business and they just go for it thinking that what got them good as an employee is going to get them good as a business owner. And it's the furthest thing from the truth. Claude. 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 Yeah. Ah, he beat you too. He beat Google. Google. He beat Google. He's got a built-in Google. He's, He's got a built-in Google. He's just, built just slow Google. accent. He's just like, just, <laughs> do you know what? I had to think of the woman's name first because I know what Catherine Claude is. Yeah, Karen. I've, I've, I've yeah. seen her in life. Less amazing than I thought you were. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so, so, unconscious in conscious the first. So then, obviously, my step law, because she went out and lesson and realised, oh, hang on, I'm grinding the gears. <laughs> I'm going around the corner at 40 miles an hour and scaring the driver and stuff. She did become aware of what she didn't know and how difficult this thing is. And it's called conscious incompetence, where suddenly, you start this business, you're hemorrhaging money all over the place, you know, it, it's, it's bleeding out of every pore. <laughs> Been there, done that. You're wasting tens of thousands of pounds. You're conscious of your incompetence. And it's incredible how you do that happen. You move from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence very quickly when you're hemorrhaging money like the coach market. And so, obviously, when you come, become consciously incompetent, and the next step up with driving, obviously she's grinding the gears, she has to think about everything that she's doing. But eventually, because she's repeating, 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 learning, getting more lessons, getting more experience, she then becomes consciously competent. So she still has to think about changing gears. She has to remember to look in the mirror before she maneuvers. But she's getting better. And then the final step on the four steps is where you know you've done 17 lessons, or in my mom's case, 57 lessons, and failed the driving test six times. <laughs> she was amazing. I'm amazed I let her on the roads after failing the driving test six times. But anyway, um, <clears throat> you become so good that you're unconscious and confident. And the problem with unconscious competence is that when something new happens, the market changes, you can just rely on your autopilot to fix problems instead of thinking. And, and you need to go back to starting again on those four steps for every new challenge. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a, a couple of years ago. So I, I've at uh, work, I've recently been talking about, so I work with data. Yeah. My main currency is data. And I've realised that how I present myself as an advertising brand expert, I'd actually become a survey expert. I was an expert in 20, 30 minute surveys. And I could do it myself. I could spot the problem in data. You know, I'd be able to open the data and go, something about this doesn't look for and I'd ask them to check it up there, and then it turned out to be another day. So it had got to the point of other problems The problem was that I was unconscious and unconscious in all of the new words and and made so, I remember getting on a call with some people that were very confused and new and really bumbling over something. You know, I, was, I, I suddenly became conscious of that. Yeah. And, and it, was a, it was a really interesting process to kind of go, right, I'm really good at this, and I'll always be really good at this, and now I need to almost go back to school and restart the process. And so, what I talk about, about uh, being data multi-linear, 
and, and, this, and, and one of the data, uh, data monitoring, and so I, um, I push our team to look at the question and then go to find whatever bit of data we want. In the same, so the comparison I think is a way of kind of trying to help them over and to other languages. So imagine it's the equivalent of the goal meets from the train station. And by the way, you would have to learn all the time. You'd get your Facebook out and you'd go, Google Translate, more than this. Okay, yeah, Google Translate. Or, you know, whatever we need to get to. You'd only have to work out that question in that area. And we're all just about competency. So let, let's go down that route again. So yes, that's fair. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I think a lot of businesses, with, I go back to voice, Andrew. It's an emerging technology. No one knows about it right now. And there's a lot of change going on in the voice technology. Even if it's only on the platforms, I mean, yeah. each of the development platforms are announcing the enhancements to the kids, the expansions of the um, facilities. Um, I mean, I, I'm still digesting all the things that are going to the Alexa line. Um, but there's, I, I know it's going to help explode the market um, and make it easier. Um, I'm just thinking back to the, um, one of the things he said about a load of firefighters who were stuck in a valley. I can tell you what, this is a really good story, yeah? yeah. It's awesome. So, so these were, here's, here's the team of really competent firefighters. They parachute in into the fire and create a, normally create a fire break to uh, well, they, 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 they help try and suppress the fire. But the fire was coming so fast towards them, they decided to try and climb up. This top, this top, this top, this top. So they were trying to cut the fire they normally would. Yeah. But because it was in a gully, yes. the wind changed direction and whipped the fire up with the friends around them. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So one of them, um, they so they're all trying to climb up the cement, uh, up the sort of uh, base to get away from the fire. One of them decides to drop all of his equipment and quickly build uh, a burn all the mass around him. Some of the fire can't burn that mass and it leaps over him and carries up, up the ravine and everyone. Um, and the rest perish because they're, they're trying to carry all their equipment on their back because they didn't think of the very first thing that you should do is say to so because they're all my equipment, everything to me, I'm a professional, I'll try and love you this massive backpack with everything to get and still try and get away from the fire. I mean it, it's an amazing story. And, and yeah they all died because they tried to carry their backpacks up a 75 degree slope while climbing out the bridge in the spot. Because they were professionals and they should never leave any of their equipment behind. And they've been trained that that's what you do. So. <laughs> they've been trained that's what you do. And, and that's really interesting, isn't it? So what are you saying there is that systems are great, but you can't beat flexibility by bringing in new knowledge and, and, and you know, trying new things that save your business. Yeah. Which I thought was a really good idea. Uh, and what, what are the... Good. So I was just going to say, um, in, in the business world, that's the equivalent of Blockbusters and Kodak. So Kodak was the first to develop a digital camera. He uses those. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, carry on though. Tell so, us. So, Kodak developed a digital camera way before it. Like, you know, the R&D team came to the board and went, look at this amazing new technology. And... <laughs> the, uh, I'll, I'll talk to Lee. Talk to Lee. Um, so have you, do you know the Kodak story? Uh, have you heard of Kodak? I actually, I actually, I actually <laughs> had one of their first digital cameras. Oh, did you really? So they, I won it as a prize as, um, for a manufacturer. What, what year was that? Uh, well, I, was, I can't remember the year, but it would have been 12, years ago. Okay, so 2000. Yeah. So it was the first one that they released. The problem was, by the time they released the digital camera, uh, yeah. Everyone else had been already, you know, they, they weren't the first to release A, but they were the first. They should have cleaned them. Oh, they should have cleaned them. So the, so the problem was, the problem was that Kodak, they were a manufacturing company. They weren't a photography company. They had hundreds of manufacturing plants for bolts and, and And the guys in, you know, the bean counter, the finance people said, 
Yeah. So not release our own competition because all of our money is tied up in powering through millions and millions of rolls of films. That's where all of our revenues They effectively carried their heavy equipment for future days and Kodak doesn't exist in Absolutely. And the VI, the VI, you guys, they can digital. Yes, they can do digital. And yet, they let it go. Just take a call as well. Excuse me. Look, look, they owned it. I thought they were offered to buy it, but they refused. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
keep falling off. <laughs> what do you do? You could invent a system where every Wednesday night you go in and you tighten all your nuts around the cup. Or you can find out why your nuts are falling off your wheels and you're losing wheels every week. Does that make sense? So what a lot of people do is they try putting fixes in and they're not asking what is actually the cause of this problem. What going do I see? What's the... I've had exactly that problem where I have a slow puncture. So every weekend I pump up the tyres to yeah, make sure yeah, yeah. they last so the week. So you've got systems in it, tyres are flat. Fact, yeah. yeah. Whereas I should really just take it in and go, find why that... Why find the going cause. Yeah, and find, find the actual hole in the tyre. Yes, absolutely. And, and yeah, finding the root cause of a problem in your business, rather than putting, you know, slapping you know, quick fixes and systems on top, is far more effective. Trebling the traffic to your website when the first thing you look at really should be why they're bouncing off the first page of the website because it's rubbish. Or, <laughs> or they're halfway through the, the purchasing site and there's, there's something that just makes them then fall off halfway through the shopping cart is a lot more of a greater insight than going, actually, we just need tens of more thousand people hitting the website. So the symptom would be not enough orders. Yeah. The tactical solution would be, well, get more links onto your website. Pay yeah. more for pay per click. Get more SEO. That's not the problem, though. Yeah. Asking the right questions is, is you know, yeah. use hot who's the target market? You just know, scan every What's page, the see why they're going through, what they're doing, using you see the hot job. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's cool. It's a piece of software, it, it basically monitors, uh, you have to be careful with GDPR now, you have to tell people that, are, that you're monitoring the website for um, enhancements and statistics and things like that. But basically, it will record all of the um, transaction of the session, and you can see when people scroll up and down when they where take they where they go. So, 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 you could, so you could go, well, they going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Wow, I need to simplify yeah. my website. Because you, you often find the second visited page after your home page is the about page <laughs> and not the product page that you were hoping that they were going to go to. Yeah. On, on that line, which is nothing to do with what we're talking about here, but really useful, um, is uh, I did a mail shot a little while ago um, with uh, Royal Mail, and, uh, and one thing that I've noticed is in, things go in cycles, don't they? We get millions of emails every day. You might get You probably get it. Yeah, I don't get them. But I get quite a few. You get them. Hundreds of thousands. But yeah, subscribe to every man. Every man's best on the planet. Um, I like to be informed. You like to be informed and enjoy it. <laughs> so, um, with that, what they do is I was going to print out a, 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 you know, a, an article with the idea of obviously getting them calling me up and asking for leads. And what, what Royal Mail do is they can, they've got software where you can give them your PDF and it will actually, using artificial intelligence, trace around where people's eyes go on your brochure so you can see where they're stopping and where, where, where your weaknesses are. So I completely ignore that and wasted a couple of thousand pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Like every good business owner, yeah. you know, having taken advantage of the you tools and the knowledge I was given, I thought I'll just try it anyway. And the thing about that is, um, one of the things that he talked, uh, that Road Less Stupid talks about is, what's an acceptable risk? What's an acceptable loss? And, and his opinion is, any stupid loss is unacceptable. Not well, you know. It's high risk, but the returns are massive, and it's only a hundred pounds. That's gambling. Yeah, but it's just about looking at the second and third effects of doing something. Exactly. Yeah. Consequences of actions, which I'll talk about in just a bit. And he's, he's a, he, he says something really interesting for us business owners. Um, he says, "What makes you think because you're good at a job that you'll be good at running a business?" And also. The weaknesses you've got in your business, if you're lazy, if you surf the internet for half the day, you know, if you, you waste all your time, if you, you, don't, you don't deliver your stuff for your employer, 
you will do exactly the same in your business. You won't change your personality or your habits at all. You won't be more motivated. You'll be the same. And I found that for me to be so true. You know what I mean? I'm, I'd be great at business if it wasn't shooting myself in the foot every day. <laughs> I say that quite hard of me, but you know, obviously yeah. I'm, you see, I'm not so so stop, stop making shiny new things to push out onto social media yeah. Yeah. and actually do the work. He's just like yeah. picking up the shovel and actually doing the grind doing the that grind. needs to be done. And he says something really amusing. I'm going to read it because it's just struck me. He says, quitting a job to start a business makes as much sense as buying a new bed if you don't like who you're sleeping with. I <laughs> 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 that was just classic. Um, Lee, do you want to go grab another It's all right, I'll go grab one in a second. But, uh, I've, got, I've, got, I've got quite a funny, uh, quite a funny story for you actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know a guy that works for a guy. <laughs> uh, basically, it's in, it's in a car it's it's uh, yeah. mechanics car. Yeah. And uh, essentially, what, what he did was, so he, he brought, like, you know, if anyone misses, like, you know, he's a guy. So they, they buy, um, they buy the parts up to quite cheap, so we're talking like an off fuel fuel thing. And they buy it, you know, £16, and then they charge customers £9, you know, yeah. just for the part. Wow. So they charge, yeah, this is decent. Um, so obviously they do all right. So they bought this part for £16, um, they have the mechanic and a friend now to fit it, and then they've had to send the driver to go pick it up, yeah. every half yeah. there. So he comes in, he sees it online, it could be cheaper. He sends a driver 45 minutes each way to go and fetch his one, uh, another half hour or so to go and return the previous one, and then a mechanic an hour or so to remove the old one, fit the new one and have it sent back to save people a bit. I was like, just in, just in the hours, like, it blew my mind, I was just like, I was like, to say 50 pence, is ridiculous. You said, like, we took talking five, six man hours. So what he probably should have done there is remember that. Do, just remember it for you. That's right. The thing is, and do the math. Yeah, yeah, do the math. Yeah, that's what the same. He did the math and said, Yeah, that'd be good. Why do you want to drink, buddy? Same again, buddy. I'll send a coke, please. So I'll probably do it. John, I'm going to run off the top side. I'm going to run off the top side. Yeah, sure. So. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll go see them, right? Just come away, stare at the camera, like, oh, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> so, here's the thing about us. Um, as I said, what you do in your job, you're doing your business. Now, you and I have been talking a lot, haven't we, over there? Yeah, Let's go some more things, thank you. Um, and, and one of the things that I think you're starting to realise is that the habits you've got into in your contact, yeah. Kind of seeping over into your, uh, the, the stuff you really want to do, which is yeah. your Alexa voice platform and your, the yeah. chat box yeah. and all that. Yeah. And um, I like to think you're starting to just make changes in the right direction. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, it's slow as It is immensely slow. Um, and when you start, uh, I think if, if you look at all the questions that you've raised in the book, um, it's, it's overwhelming. Yeah. The, the amount of things you need to consider. It is. And, and then you go. Well, and, and I shouldn't start a new business. <laughs> that, that, well, <laughs> yeah. That, well, yeah. Well, yeah. That's the easy bit. Well, yeah, it because, is. Because if you don't have a tune, yeah, no, but I did say that I wanted to do. So uh, here you go, mate. Thank you, but I'll, I'll tell you the post. So, <laughs> they should give you a little card in the tab box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they did this bit out. Yeah, yeah. Well, we won't edit. This is live. <laughs> they think it's live. They think it's live. It's really recording. Yeah, it? Now, we, we couldn't do such a bad job if this was actually recording. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, the e myth, you know, so you realise. So that's the e myth revisited yeah. by Michael E. Gerber. Super book. I would yeah. say that goes hand in hand with this book. Yes. Because it's really good in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and he, he has, I think, produced one of the books which I'm looking at the about the blueprint. I might actually buy some of them. But they look extremely expensive on Amazon. Really? Yeah. Really? yeah. And I think that's because they're rare. It's probably because he's, he's doing an upsell, isn't he? He's got his product yeah. out there. Yeah. Because I was, tem I was tempted to buy it again. I was, really? tempted to get, I was thinking, what is in this book? Hang on, sorry, this book is that full of stuff. I'll let you meet me both in a second. Yeah. So we're just talking about, so obviously yeah. Keith Herring has got other books. Yeah. But the, one of the books, so the Road Less Stupid is what we're talking about. 
But he recommends other books in the world of Street. And one of them is Chung and Quiz. So obviously he's thinking, ooh, the people who bought the Road Less Stupid also bought. <laughs> <laughs> and why does I do that? What a trick! <laughs> it's what? I bet you need a book. You realise that the Road Less Stupid is Willpower. I bet you are a very dream. And so am I, though. Well, the Road Less Stupid, though. But the thing is, it's, 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 it's not. I am honestly. Uh, and therefore, he is playing exactly on my piano. Yeah. All the notes that, go, that I go. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, and it's the same. If you hit your niche, you should be able to sell them the world yeah, yeah. that relates to their niche so. because you know you them that well. Yeah. That you every every time you're hitting a pain point, they should go. Okay. Because so, yeah, he talks about um, um, what, 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 down. You shouldn't have to actually sell your product because as soon as they realise it's there, yes. it's so obvious they need it that they just go. Oh, it, it, I'm showing you my money. Please take my money. And I see and I see a lot of that Facebook at the moment with these seven, eight figure yeah, coaching practices, yeah. well, just, or whatever it is that you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it's they transformed and, overnight. Because you could just see loads of people. Loads of people. <laughs> that's the weirdest. That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got to show you how to do drink here. Really that's got to be the smallest yeah. cup ever. It's very dainty, isn't it? Like, I don't know what it is. I think, I think it's, it's a, a, it's a cup of tea, isn't it? It's like a mother cider. It's like a mother cider. But it just makes me think how many. But because they've been. Particularly on the passive income, they, they, they put out this stuff on passive income, and you just go, you're pressing all their buttons because it's you know, inherently. Everybody wants with, passive with income, it costs you nothing, and it yeah. just carries on going. But he says that that's not the case. You know, just, just, seriously, what, what do you think you can do that results in you receiving passive income? Yeah. It doesn't matter what systems you put in place. There is always exceptions to everything that goes through the system. One of the things that he talked to was really upset with this was the fact that I don't want to talk about how to consume don't worry, you can make it. Sorry, you're only lying. You're only lying. One of the things that he mentioned. Oh, God, I'm lying. And one of the things that he mentioned is that, that, that even when you've acquired, acquired it, which is like, you know, Bill Gates and that, it's still a, a full-time job to retain it. You to carry on getting that income. You've taken it. It's never passive. Which I thought was quite interesting. Because you know, even if you've got a good passive income, you know, it's, yeah, fair enough. But it's just going to stay at the same rate. You know, if that's not right, like, you know, someone's got to rise your inflation. I mean, you know, you've got to look at the barriers to entry. Because if you can turn the system around that makes it easy to do, I can copy that. Therefore, the barrier to entry is virtually zero. And therefore, suddenly, you could find in a competitive world to get something else. People like to copy ideas. And sometimes they copy it and do better, don't they? Which is not good. So, um, here's an interesting question that he asks. Not for me. And, um, and this is really important for people like us who have small business without a board of directors. And the question is, if I had a board of directors, would they give me a raise or would they sack me? That's a tough question, isn't it? Because I think I'd be sacked. <laughs> I'd sack me for what's the it does, make, <laughs> it, it does raise some really interesting questions. You know what? You've got your own business. Just ask yourself that question. Because it really is. Yeah. Right, cut it. So, okay. And also, one of the things that you talked to me is, is okay, you need dashboards in place. You need to understand your business. And you talked about the F16 fighter plane. Right. And uh, he's talked about how complex the dashboard is because you heard me and Ron get about 400 miles per hour and you have to make quick adjustments because otherwise oh, you'll get a nano smoke or do some other exact thing. You need to know and your life is in the balance. You need to know every component of that thing is working. He compares it to a a tricycle. <laughs> so if you're running a business like a tricycle, what you need is a little fat. 
Yeah. It takes a large amount of effort to get going, and you can probably just keep on pedaling to get where you need to go. You'll never but get you get won't faster. have an F-16 fighter fighting to fight it. Um, There's a big difference in performance. Yeah. And also attitude. Yeah. And training, and all yeah. sorts of yeah. things. Yeah. So, uh, so I thought that was really funny. So, uh, I think... Uh, you, uh, don't worry, that's okay. You mentioned something actually on, uh, on one of our kings, you know, and, and that's about, um, and this is a really interesting psychological thing, employee perks. So one of the things that he talks a lot about in the book is giving, is, is teamwork and employees. Culture, get culture most, versus teamwork. Yeah, and how do you make most out of people who are working with your employee? Um, and one of the things that he's not here is giving the employees perks. Um, hey, do you want to talk about that for a bit? Do you remember what you said? If you don't, don't worry, I can put a sign out for you. You don't need to jump on the room because I'm going to do a lot of things. No, don't worry. So, here's the thing. So, I, I did some work a while ago. I've worked with some, with some amazing companies over my year. I'm sure you have as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really big work. Just Massive corporation, multinational, million of people, hundreds of thousands of employees around the world. The programs I've been working on, multi multi million pound budgets. Um, and the interesting thing that I've seen, I've seen internal workings of at least 30 big multinationals and the attitude to the employees while I've been there. And the really interesting thing is, first thing is, I found that a business that doesn't have a documented vision, a documented mission statement, and a culture that is everywhere and talk to the employees is a whole place to work. And the thing about being that, and we've talked covered this in a profit yeah, yeah. The thing about that is, if you don't instigate and train and enhance and bring in a culture into a company and the way people work, it develops on its own. And unfortunately, look at Darwin and evolution, anything that evolves on its own really becomes gruesome and backstabby and not a nice thing. Uh, and so, if you rely on a culture that's evolved on its own, it's, it doesn't work. And so, um, so that's the first point, talking about company culture. Okay. Uh, and so he talks a lot about that. He talks about setting expectations for employees. And the really interesting thing that he's well against is employee perks, which is really interesting. And I think back to all the multinational corporations I've worked with, and one of the things that I've noticed is that the corporations that give the most perks to their employees have the most disgruntled employees, in my opinion. That is my, there's probably statistics out there. But I found personally that people who grumble the most have the most <laughs> entitlement. That's it. Because what happens is, yes, I went for Don't get it wrong. Yeah. You start giving free breakfast as a, as a nice little bonus, and everyone thinks that's amazing. It's not a great company. We went for a company that gives us free breakfast. Then you realise it's costing you a load of money. You stop the free breakfast, what happens? Suddenly you, you've really insulted all the employees because you've taken away something that they've become entitled to. It's their right to have a free breakfast. Um, we, uh, <laughs> you must have come across this. Yeah, that was uh, a couple of years ago they cancelled our set of pubs. We should have been about 50, 60 feet. Right. right. <laughs> That's outweighed. Indignation. And, and, and we were all like, you know, surely for 50, 60 quid ahead, they should have just put it ahead. They've got to go ahead and put it on, given how upset we were. Then it was yeah, thousands of pounds. Yeah, they wanted to take out the budget, but well, it, it, it become a it's part of our salaries. Yes, I am paying twenty thousand pounds a year at a summer party. At a summer party. <laughs> a summer party with some people. I I I, I wanted to see. Shh, shh, shh. watching. All your favourite people you've worked with, obviously. Yeah. I know, I know the preferences. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Something like that, like just, just as an example. Yeah, no, yeah. You know, the amount of times I've been taught to you know, it's not massive, massive. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Massive, yeah. yeah. so obviously there's, there was a logic in what you Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
But people can feed themselves. Maybe they can, unless you mean. So, uh, I'll give you an example of some of the happy little company I'm working with right now. Who is a staff. They got free tea and coffee. But they wanted proper coffee machines. You know what I mean? And so the company invested a lot of money in putting these massive Nespresso towering amazing coffee machines in on every floor of a five floor office and in other locations. And they charged, to break even on that, they charged 40 people per day. What didn't the uptakers be? You'd think so, wouldn't you? So they've invested, but the employees have had this free tea and coffee, and they're expecting Starbucks quality, espresso, you know, free tea and coffee from those things. But of course, that costs the company a lot of money, and so all they wanted to do was break even on the pod side. To cover the, the cost of it. But people then started going online and buying their own pods. <laughs> and taking them to, to, the save, to take them to the machine and, and saving five pence a pod. <laughs> <laughs> but when you look at the post and back and you're all the effort, probably not. So, um, but at least you've got to be really careful. So, what, what he says in his book is that really don't implement perks. Keep people trained on social events. Because that's a team building exercise. Very important. But also make sure that you that people expect to have accountability. They expect to have ownership. There's a lovely chapter about the woman that's supposed to keep the foyer out of the Yes. You like that you Yeah, because he, he talks about insulting trains this lady. He's about training and yeah. thinking yeah. you communicate. Yeah, yeah. So, he, so he's laid out exactly the, the fact that the whole of the foyer needs to be get clean so guests and new and visitors come in. And then he goes in one morning and it's become obvious that the floor hasn't been wiped, probably it's a winter, everyone's trudged through. There's a complete mess. So the pause is like you can hang it one or two ways. You can read some on the right side, or you can talk to them and go, so where have I failed to express that this is your job? It's very clever the way he says it. Yeah, and he, and he lays out exactly the cap to put over to his because he says, when I asked her, she gave me a I didn't notice. I was too busy, but it makes extra sense. So, and he goes through a whole meticulous process of explaining how yes. you can talk to someone and go, right, so what didn't I explain that this was the, this was your part of your job? Is there anything I can do to make sure that you realise this is part of your job? Because I don't stop paying you if you don't do this. Oh, well, no. if you want to get sacked, because <laughs> he realises that the only way to it's really is to help yeah, it's a help. Or, yeah, it's a, so this is part of your job. If you don't do it, you will have to lose your job. And in fact, it's such a parody that she came, she didn't care what came back with all the things that she needed to know or be reminded of or helped out on so that she could actually do the thing that she wanted it to, to be done. So if she was busy managing reception, then she was, and, and a timer had gone off, then she was to call someone to say, I need someone to help do this because I'm busy. Uh, it's, I mean, it was, it was, it, it, I mean, I'm not going to steal the book, but it was, it, it's a classic way of how to, re how to tell an employee, I don't stop paying you, but I expect you to do your half of the equation. I like the fact that he said, right, when you've got people on your team, yeah. um, you always pay them. Always. Regardless of how good or bad job they've done that month. Yeah. And you don't not pay them because, well, you don't do it. But if they haven't performed, if they come up with excuses, if they haven't met their... Well, yeah. most of all, the responsibility, he talks about this, and I talk about this in business owners all the time, is really, if you're in 
employee is failing, go and look at what you're not doing to help them understand what they need to do. So putting in key performance indicators is the number one thing. Getting them to define what their roles and your skills are going to and then you talking about which is basically really important. The um, we're, we're good, thank you. Go ahead, take you want to do it, thank you. Um, so key performance indicators are really important. Getting them to know what the, to document what they what they think their roles and responsibilities are is really important. Looking at things, key blockers. Looking at things that the, the ten most frustrating parts of their job, the ten most fulfilling parts of their job, the ten most things that stop them from getting delivering stuff for customers. Those kind of things. Putting together proper roles and responsibilities, having them buy into that, is really important. Okay. And giving them ongoing training, not doing it once and then abdicating that training and thinking that they're going to do it and remember, because they won't. And the thing about that is, so I might bang on to business owners about, if you're going to train someone, record what you're doing. Because the person you're training might leave. I've just had an experience where they spent a lot of time training, a business owner of mine spent a lot of their time training someone who's just started. And I, I asked that person to record everything they're doing because they might need, they will need to repeat this at some point. And when you're leveraging your time if you can record this and set up an induction program for the next new employee. Of course, they didn't. And of course, this person's just quit after a very short period of time. So he's good. He or she. He's not doing that. And it's just a big secret. Most meetings when it's also expanded, you know, have all the current employees coming up down to get the trying to bring as you train up. You use them to So if you in a crisis and you start to pull the new people, you're actually making yourself worse because most of you're trying to bring people up, you even source go bring in the new game on all the best practices in your software out for example. Yeah, that's why you get learning the culture, doing all that. You will actually make the whole team unproductive, which could actually get your bottom line. Yeah. So what, what the problem this guy has in his business is the chief salesperson. He brings in all the money. But obviously he needs a support system. So when someone leaves or start or, or he has a problem with the team, he's the person has to deal with it. He's, and the thing is you have to shut up people to deal with their own problems. And happens to do it. Otherwise, you end up just running around and it goes back, and, and in the book, Road Less Stupid, it goes back to the business cycle of business. And I've, talked, I've probably talked about this one because it's before and after. So, but, but just for people who want to because I know we know the cycle of business, <laughs> but we don't know it because it's, we're still in line, we're still not doing it. So you've got the business owners at the time, you've got the team, you've got the customers at the time, and you've got the other one over there. Point for you. Yeah, you see, I'm not that tech to So I'll come back to that later. So one of the key things that Keith Harrington says is that optimism is the enemy of rational, of the rational investor. What do you think it means by that? So I thought that was really interesting. Optimism is the enemy of the rational investor. Which means that like you can So someone who's optimistic always thinks that someone's gonna work out. Whereas they don't think things through. They don't look at the strategy and what they're doing. And one of the things that he mentions is that if you want to do better, you've got to get better. And that's one of the things that this is all about. You know, book club is actually changing our minds so that we get better, so that we can do better. Does that make sense? And, and if we neglect our mindset, is it as important as an employee to, to grow your mindset as it is as a business owner? I mean, it should be. It should be. It should be. That's that common phrase, isn't it? Where they said, um, 
what if we train our staff and they leave? Yes, that's right. <laughs> what if we train our staff? Well, they wouldn't if we be. don't train them. <laughs> if we don't train them stay. and they stay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is even worse, isn't it? Yeah. So, but the thing is, if you, if you actually invest... So the ones that want to learn that want to leave anyway. <laughs> You know what, nothing, but if you can, one of the tricks with employees and teams is to be able to give them micro promotions throughout the year that matter to them, knowing what makes them tick and giving them those micro promotions and helping them feel like they're progressing is really important. The key um, to the executive bathroom. That kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> no, that's a perk. Uh, no, they become entitled there is a perk, don't they? Hey? And then, my, yeah, I won't be actually. So, so, so that's really important. Now, it also says there's no such thing as a natural business owner. People think they're natural business owners and they're just going to be able to do it, but they can't. And so I think that's really interesting. So, um, so here's the thing. He talks about second order consequences in, in all of our decisions. Now, and he also talked about risk taking and actually making decisions and thinking about stuff. And the important thing he's think he says is this. So there's a phrase that I used to use ages ago. Um, is if you pick up a stick off the floor, you pick up one end, the other end comes hurt. Yeah. And the other end might have dog poo on it. <laughs> So, so that is good outcome. It's not, it's not a good outcome, is it? So, but the thing is, what I mean by that is, you choose your actions, you pick up the stick, but you don't choose the second order consequences of those actions. And one of the things that, that Keith says, Keith is my best mate. Yeah, I love it. Personally, it was first name basis, Dave. I hope he's watching. Stupid order. I'm sure he's not watching. He's a multi millionaire. Yeah. Um, we'll, so, ta we'll tag you. Tag you. Tag you a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's a big promo in the book, isn't it? Yeah. And with five people watching this, he's obviously going to sell millions. <laughs> so, first thing he says is this: Whenever you're going to make a decision, you've got to write, yeah, down, you've got to write down what's the upside of this decision. Right? So you write down all the upsides. And people are really good at working out what the upsides of the decision. Then what you've got to do. He's got to write down all the downsides of this decision. People are not good at looking at what the possible downsides could be. Especially when they make an emotional decision already, and we talk about emotion and intellect, the more the emotion goes into the decision, the lower the intellect goes. Okay? And, and if you've invested There's already, a whole chapter on taking some additional investment. It's like a business loan and the implications, you know, what is so critical that you're going to take on a business loan which is going to have to be repaid and if the thing you're doing doesn't work out, yeah. you've suddenly you got some that massive way. loan that you need to repay. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it gives things in such clarity that you just, you know, do we really want to do this? Yeah. And the funny thing about it is that um, I have thought I've tried this process of looking at the upside and then writing down at the downside, but because I'm emotionally involved in, in it, I don't see. What don't I see? I didn't, I didn't ask myself that question enough. And I'm going to make more effort to look for the downside and do it. And when you've exhausted all the downside, Spend another five minutes looking for the downside, at least. Um, and and, and wait for them. So it, it's not, so it's not everything is possibly going to happen. So, so you need to look at it. You said, you know, you said when you're listing all of the downside, you know, terrorist attack. Pretty low. <laughs> That's a low probability. That's your language spot. But, but policy changes by the government that go cripple the way that you can operate, uh, competitor coming into the market. Because it's a low barrier to entry, all those sorts of things. That could happen, yeah, absolutely. And, and so, when you've listed the upside, which will be really massive, and you listed the downside, which will be two things, <laughs> but then you've thought more about the downside, the next question is, well, can I live with the downside? Let's look at what the worst possible outcome for this is. And it's not being pessimistic or negative thinking, this is being, well, thinking. This is actually yeah. using your brain. He talks brain. about plotting them in circles that get bigger and bigger. He said, yeah. if you see a clustering of problems that can be the outcome of this, walk away. Yeah. So the more problems you see, the 
you're more likely that that downside will actually be the result. And so, if you find that you can live with that result, the worst possible scenario from a key business decision, and you're happy with that, boss, which really should never be, then go ahead and do it. So there's a company in Manchester that hosted all of HMRC's services. Why? Their biggest customer. They scaled to meet the requirements of HMRC. Okay, I've seen this before. <laughs> yeah. And then guess what? HMRC switched to Amazon because they're investigating. So there's two things there. One, never rely on one source of income. Yes. And because you know, they've gone bankrupt. And I've, I've, yeah, sorry, Dad. And, and, and then the second one is about governance and what well, your business is behind the government. That's HMRC's business, really. Yeah, it certainly is. So, I can't find the it. No. So I've, I've seen this, and, and I think you're probably in this situation, isn't it? Where you've got one major person in the world, and your business supplies that one person. And if they decide to change service, like, it's going to be really difficult. But you don't know what's going on in the background and what other people have tried to approach that. And I, I've seen this a lot. Yeah. And what happens is, all your eggs are in one basket. Your, your business is not a tripod. It's a single pole with your business balanced on the top as a plate. And if you've got that, it's so risky. It's so dodgy. At some point, you can guarantee that will, that will, it will collapse. And he talks, he, talks about, he talks about clustering at any aspect of your business. If, if the key IP is in the head of one employee, that's intellectual property, by the way, then you have a problem. I mean, that, that's what single point like. of failure. Yeah. Any single point of failure in any business yeah, yeah. is a point. If everything's hosted in the cloud, as long as it's multiple clouds, that's fine. I have started to reevaluate about everything that can go I'm clustering. That's never a good thing now, I've discovered. Absolutely. And that's, a, that's something that. So, he also talks about the five core disciplines of thinking. Do you know what they are? Yeah, I know you do. There's a bit of enthusiasm here. You're falling asleep, aren't you? Yeah. No. <laughs> you can't see him on the camera, he's going. What is doing It's Sunday night. <laughs> It's Sunday night, it's late. And the Sith yeah. are very good. I, I, I'm genuinely interested. I'm joking, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. This is too tough. No, come on, don't do that. Because you will fall asleep. Um, <laughs> so, the, the num so, the five core disciplines of thinking. The first core discipline is find the unasked question. Because you ask lots of questions, but really, if you're emotionally invested in something, are you asking the right questions? And that's the difficult thing. Yeah, absolutely. So when you've asked all the questions you can possibly think about, about a decision, ask more. Yeah, ask more. And ask good questions. So the first one is find the unasked question. The second one is separate the problem from the symptom. So, we mentioned earlier about all the different problems that business owners face. You know, in the lack of cash flow, lead generation, sales conversion, all the classic symptoms of a problem that really, if they're not asking the right question, they'll pour more money into stuff that won't, that won't work. High staff turnover. High staff turnover. We need to get rid of stuff. It's not, that's, yeah, that's not the that's, problem, that's, that's a symptom. Yeah. Of a bad culture, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Lack of training yeah. and lack of systemization, lack of, lack of tightening the nuts and making sure the stay tight on, yeah. the, on your wheels. Yeah, great. So, first thing, find the unasked question. Second thing is separate the problem from the symptom. The third thing is check your assumptions. Check your assumptions. Now, having worked on multi, multi million pound programs, one of the classic things in IT that they do is when they put a proposal together, a, a project plan or anything like that, there's a whole thing called assumptions. And if you've got a third party delivering things for you, what they do is they put down assumptions. 
And if you're actually a clever person, what you'll do is you'll read these assumptions and question them. Because what happens is when they don't deliver the final product for you, or they deliver a dog's dinner, which happens all the time, they'll quote, well, we told you that we assumed that this was there, and that was there. And the biggest assumption they make is that the per the, the, the so I know uh, team team can look after it themselves. <laughs> all the knowledge will pass all that the, all the resources in the the client will be readily available all the time for the the <laughs> client, right. for the supplier. The supplier yeah. It's paid. a classic assumption. Yeah. And what they'll do is they'll prepare a massive spreadsheet of all the times that the client wasn't there for them. Yeah. And they've been built. But you'll be paying them and they won't be paying your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> But the client doesn't do that because the client trusts the assumptions. They don't read the assumptions. So check your assumptions that they're accurate. I know a software house that said, okay, we're going to model your existing system. So we're going to run every possible transaction through your system and build the output. And we know in our replacement system, we, can, we will have met the criteria for acceptance when we put the same inputs in and get exactly the same output. It's a perfectly logical thing to do. It does sound logical. Yeah. What was the catch? Yeah. What the catch was that the system didn't behave the same all the time. Okay. So on certain days of the year, when you put the value in, it didn't come out with the same answer. Like, oh, well, no, the so they tested it on a couple of days, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they forgot the fact there's obviously rules in there yeah. for periodic variance, yeah. yeah. and that was an assumption yeah. that it's going to be the same the whole year. On Christmas yeah. Day, we don't do this. On Boxing Day, and we of course, don't. The client didn't think to tell the supplier that because they assume. Mm -hmm. So assumptions are made on both sides. Yeah. That's really interesting because that's happened a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's happened a massive amount. Um, Many, many moons ago, I went through a process of looking at... Say what? Oh, no, don't rotate the phone! <laughs> oh, that's no. <laughs> all! Why are you just getting more nearly rotate? Someone really yeah. happy. So, uh, several years ago, well, we, I was in charge of going through a process of finding the bottom line. The so revenue was, was slow. Um, and so they, they asked me to look at improving the bottom line. And one of the biggest problems in our bottom line being smaller than it should have been was issues with assumptions. Why? So there was an assumption from the client that we were going to ask, answer their questions. There was an assumption on our side that we understood those questions were. There was an assumption from the director of the project that the junior people knew what their role on the project was. And when, when I went and started looking at projects that were losing money, there were some people that, for example, they would send the presentation that they put together to, to be ready to, to do their analysis. They'd send it to the project. And in their project, they, they built in four rounds of review with the client. And I said, hey, if you had made sure you knew what the client was in the first place, surely you should be able to land it right the first time. At best, there should be one review and rebound. Yeah. And they said, well, no, because when we send the first one, they go, you haven't answered this question. What about that? And this doesn't address my issue, ABC. And I go, so we went through these processes of saying, okay, let's, number one, put together a whole range of, kind of okay, we think the question is this. Our hypothesis is that. And the recommended you that you told you, if this is your question, and that's the outcome, the recommendation that we will make two months from now, is to do action ABC. And it totally changed the way the project works. So what happened is that we started making sure we, we, we challenged our assumptions that we understood their questions. And we also kind of challenged some of our assumptions around recommendations. So sometimes we said, we will recommend that you cancel this celebrity. And then, and then we have to go, you can't recommend that. We've signed them up for two years, you have to pay them whatever happens. So then you go, know, okay, it's useful to know that. Yeah. <laughs> We, we can have done with knowing that. Yeah. Stick with them now. No, no, exactly. but, but I mean, this is where you have workshops where you play back to your clients what you've understood. But you can still have sort of assumptions in, within that. Because if you don't play, you only play back what they tell you, you don't play back what you don't know. They, and that's that back to you. 
back to what they're not seeing, which yeah. is interesting. So, five, the five, five core disciplines, I think, the first one is find the unasked question. The second one is set out the problem from the sort of symptom. The third one is check assumptions. The fourth one is look at all the second order consequences. And we talk about second order consequences, that's picking up the stick. And the other end might be a doggy poo. You know what I mean? So, look at the second order consequences. And the final thing on that is create the machine that will a, a plan and a, 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 a plan on people. A lot of course. Yeah. So, machine is called plan. plan on people. Yeah. So, if you create a machine, then work and do it. And there has to be a structured, organised plan to do it. People need to understand that plan and you need to identify the people who are going to be in to, to actually deliver that plan. That makes sense. Yeah. So, I'm going to turn this back again. What you alluded to, but I don't think we discussed at all, is the fact that you said, unless you know your starting position, of course. You yeah. said, so many people fixate on the future goal and where they want to be Absolutely. without knowing where they actually start. So it's in place of the assumption of the bit. You assume you know exactly where you are, but unless you know exactly where you are, you can't work out where you need to be. So, that's really interesting. Right. Not, not hold on. Right. 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 <laughs> you said that to the camera. You know, you've got brands that do that. Right. Yeah, the brands that do what? <laughs> so, um, we call it tailor made growth. Right. If you went to, imagine going to a tailor and they walk in and they say, I'm going to make you the perfect suit. We're going to make it blue and we're going to make it out of silk. And it's gonna, you're going to look amazing. I'm already thinking this is a great suit. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Could it be in pink? I'll, I'll, be in I'll, see, I'll see you in two shiny weeks. Suit, yeah. See you in two weeks. See, see you in two weeks. Come back and I'm going to make the perfect, perfect suit for you. What has the tailor not done? Not the tailor. He's not taking your measurements. No. Yeah. And the problem so is, what the so what he is. then makes is a one size fits all size suit. Can you imagine going to a tailor? And he goes, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> one size fits all I go to them all the time. I can't be So many so many businesses, so many businesses set up. So you know, I, I look at advertising and you know, things like that and advertising. Lots of businesses, they might have hundreds of brands all around the world and they'll have the same aim for all of them. Yeah. So whether they own a, you know, some specialist, you know, if they're an alcohol company, let's say they own Carlsberg, which is a cheap and cheerful lager tap, and they also own some micro brewery specialist gin, you can only get in a special one. For those two to have the same result, it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, yeah. All of our brands have to grow 1% revenue. All of our brands have to grow 1% away. And what, what we've been talking to a lot of our clients about is if you want to grow, you need to do two things. You need to identify your desired destination and understand your current situation. And understanding your current situation relative to your. And some, and, and some brands do the opposite. Some brands go, what is what? What are we currently weak at? We're currently weak. We've got low awareness. Or we're currently got, and we'll go. Wait, wait, it's fine. If you're a specialist gym, you don't need high awareness. Carlsberg needs high awareness because it's all about a walk in. Oh, beer. Carlsberg. Yeah. But if you're a specialist gym, you need differentiation. You need uniqueness. You need credibility. And so, yeah, the design destination and understanding the situation. Leads, so if you do that, brands that do and brands that don't. Brands that do, they grow their revenue by 11.3% more. That's awesome. And, and also, obviously, with what I've done in the past, people want an outcome. And they say, this is how... And, and it's amazing how many companies... Is this a strategic outcome or a tactical outcome? So here's the... <laughs> it's amazing how many people say, right, um, let's design a new process. So we, we want this, so we, we, we they, they design a new project, have some workshops, let's get people in, all the stakeholders and everybody, let's get them in and let's design a new work process, a new system that will do some amazing. But the problem is, without sitting back and actually looking at what they're currently doing, everything they're currently doing, because what they think the process is, is not what they're doing. Because they might have documented these processes years ago, and no one's doing that anymore. Because so-and-so's changed and they've not updated the process. You know what I mean? So 
knowing where they are now, I'm just reinforcing Andrew's point and your point, knowing where your business is right now, this second, is the key to, to actually getting to where you want to be. And you can't do it. The classic example... So, so you should really introduce the audience. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's a classic example is, <laughs> if I want to go to Harrogate in the UK, if you're watching this in the US, Harrogate in the UK, I need a starting destination. <laughs> I can't go on the trainline.com and say, from anywhere to Harrogate, and let's see where... Because you can do the other way around. You can go onto like a, a, a booking website. Yeah, you can say, so from, from Birmingham to, UK to, to anywhere. I just want to go anywhere. But, but, they, but they never go... Two, from <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> anywhere in the world. Because you need to know where you're coming from. You're not anywhere. It's not work. You're right here. You're right here. So knowing where you are right now is really important. And a lot of business owners are in delusion of where they are right now. They go in their head where they think they are, but they're not there. And this is great for you, by the way. Get this. Download it on all of It's so been super duper for your new role. So, okay. It raises more questions than it answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the point. point. That's the point. You, you, it's you about questions. questions. It's, it's, a, it's a book. So the biggest book of questions. What's his, view, what's his view on like freelancers in one? If it's all about employees, training employees, clear roles, not perks, doing, does he does he talk about contractors and freelancers? Well, contractors, I think, are easier because you've got you, you've got a project. You know what the key performance indicators are. Normally, yeah. yeah. If you know what you're employing the contractor for, if you're getting somebody on a vague assumption, yeah, exactly. But, you know, clear yeah. definition. And, and is I think really this, this is one of the things. Not, when when investors come in, they go, "We may, you may have invented some KPIs. Are they the right KPIs for driving your business forward? Do they actually show me where your business currently sits?" And then they look at um, uh, KPI. Uh, uh, so, um, um, uh, objectives and key indicators. O P O K I. OK eyes. Sorry, sorry. OK eyes. Don't worry about the I think you've got great eyes. Because they want to set objectives for employees. OK eyes. He's rude. They want to set eyes. So this is a new concept to me, so I'm only just getting my head right now. Yeah, sorry. So you set your employees' objectives, which are based on reaching your goal from where they currently are, and have the KPIs then behind it. So, when, so this is a lot of, um, I, having worked in the contract, I've never done that big sit down where you go, so, where do you want to see yourself in six months? Yeah. Still sitting here being paid, thank you, is normally the answer for a contractor. But as an employee, you want to be climbing the corporate ladder. You want so they go, well, to get to the next rung, you need to improve the following things. And you agree something with the line manager that's attainable this year if I need to get your bonus. But with contractors, I found that normally you have a key set of objective outcomes, and he's very keen on how to do it. With a contractor, you've got these outcomes, you don't meet those outcomes, then they got, you get rid of them. Yeah. And I've seen lots of people yeah, walk yeah, yeah. off site. I've quite often. Do you know I um, so I, I was a freelancer really in, uh, in the recent one, and I knew, and I knew, I almost I wonder whether I did better by freelancer. Yeah, because I, I think it's really good. I, I was only ever to build my last. Yeah, yeah. That I had, I had four or five people that I worked with um, as a freelancer, and there was one guy who there was stuff going on outside of work for me at the time. And I know in hindsight I delivered a really low quality piece of It was fun, it was accurate, it just wasn't. It was, it was a bit basic. I never got another project back in the world. Yeah, that's interesting. And I had this, I've done the same, where I, I know I've delivered a bad outcome. And yes, I went back there. The second time I went back to that particular company, I did have a bad outcome and I've never been that bad that since. And it was an amazing company to work for, which is a real shame. Yeah. So, so, okay, so, when you, so here's the thing. Um, when you talk about separating the symptom from the problem, there's three questions that can be asked. And I'm going to read them out because he puts them quite nicely. The first question is, what the problem? What are the possible reasons why I'm noticing this symptom? So, what are the reasons why I'm noticing this symptom? 
In other words, what pain is it causing? Yeah. What the possible reason why I'm going, why am I, as the business owner, noticing this particular symptom at this yeah. particular time? Yeah. And the problem is, normally, it's because the customer is complaining. Exactly. Most problems normally. are identified by yeah. the customer. How awful is that? It is awful. But, but they should be, they should be the last person yeah. to notice it. And yet, often, because they're the ones actually eating the meal yeah. or yeah. using well, the software. Well, it says you should celebrate your customers at everything. You, you should be absolutely, totally customer-centric. And I've worked at companies where it seemed like a revelation, like 40 years on, remit from head office, by the way, guys, we need to become customer-centric. Yeah, and you go, Hello? what? So does he, does he talk about how to, if it's, say, say the phrase again. So what are the, what are the possible reasons I'm noticing this symptom? Okay, so if there's a symptom of a problem, mm -hmm. does he talk about how to... So the costs have gone up. There's empty seats where he thought he'd got employees. And does he talk about being able to spot the symptoms earlier in the process? Because if, if the symptom is um, not being able to recruit people, sales going down, can't be unhappy, those are terrible places to notice problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And he, he talks about the questioning process yeah. that should lead you to identify these uh, things earlier. Right. So the second question is, what isn't happening but if it did, it would cause the perceived gap, the symptom, to disappear. It's in the book, you need to get the, get the book. Yeah, and yeah. Because yeah. just doing this on, on live is very difficult. The third question, so, so the third question is, what is happening that, if it stopped happening, would cause the perceived gap, the symptom, to narrow or disappear? Okay, can you read? Let me go again, because that's a bit confusing. Yeah, we've two and three hours. Basically, all right. <laughs> All right, so what isn't happening yeah. right now yeah. that if it did happen would cause the symptom okay. to narrow or disappear? So my client is currently complaining. What is not happening yeah. that if it did happen, the client would stop? If that symptom is the yeah. client's complaining, the client's complaining because I haven't been checking my data. Yeah. If it did if happen, my data, of course, what, how would that narrow it? Yeah. Then I would have yeah. spotted the problem with data, but it really was. Your quality management process yes. checks okay. that your reports are so going on the gap. So that's still fixing. Fixing. It's fixing the way. Do I, don't I need to go further back again? You do, yeah. But, but by asking the question, you're noticing what might narrow the symptom. For example, there's something that I send out once a month. And there's a line of data that shouldn't be in there, and I manually delete it every time. Okay, yeah, yeah. So client. you're just fixing the symptom every yeah. single month. Every single month. So you know what? That's a great idea. Yeah. You're creating yourself some work. Yeah, yeah. And, and every time, and, and <laughs> until and he's not there, and someone just falls exactly. into that. No, no, yes, exactly. And I've had this conversation this week with, well, last week, with, so, and, and I've talked about that, that we need to build systems because there are two or three people in our team, but they are like. Uh, you know that story of the, 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 the little boy that has kind of plugged the, the, yeah. the hole in his <laughs> dam? And he, yeah, yeah. If, he, if he takes his gun out of that hole in the dam, everything's going to go. And I, and I looked at it, and I mean, businesses that operate, they just like... Yeah, loads of thumbs in yeah. dikes. Yeah. Yeah. They call them dikes. Yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go there. This is our life. This is life. Sorry, guys. A dike is a dam in the uh, yeah. Too late, they just censored it. <laughs> so, 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 my face is on this. <laughs> What's happening yeah, that if it stopped happening yeah. would cause a perceived gap or symptom to narrow the script? So, what we're saying yeah, I need a second half, right? is all right. So now what is Basically, happening? what could we start doing? Yes. What could we stop doing? To, to, make sense? to what? In order to, to in order to, to, to jump narrow the, yeah, yeah. the symptom. Yeah. 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 So what does it mean to narrow the symptom? Well, we reduce the symptom. Reduce the symptom. Reduce get towards the problem. Okay. Yeah. Reduce the severity. So, so See, you when, you, about when you're finding out how you can reduce the symptom, you're kind of looking at what's causing the problem. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I will definitely read this book and ponder. You, you do need to read the book. The trouble is, you'll be pondering every chapter because every chapter raises so questions full. as an owner. So you read go, the book. I like said books are for notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, you'll go, if, if you read a chapter every night, you would go into work and people would be terrified and the questions are. <laughs> That's a good thing, isn't it? It is, it's because you would be you would be so informed by the end of the first month. You might decide that you need to set the whole business in a completely different direction. Yeah. And I know businesses have done that when they've asked the right questions. Sure. But can I keep an eye on the time? Because that's my time for right there. Yeah. And um, I don't want to go beyond nine o'clock, otherwise people might go to the top past nine. What sort of time is it? Ten to nine. Oh, ten, ten to, to nine, nine, really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I've had those loads of other stuff I wasn't talking on. about. Yeah. But let's just talk about some yeah. key things. So here's a link. All your business is going to be customer centric. However, one thing that he says is this. If you think the customers are number one in your business, you're wrong. Yeah. This okay. is very controversial. No, 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 I like it. Go on. All right. Employees are number one. Okay. Because your employees are looking after your customers. Because you, and here's the thing in, the, in, in small businesses, we forget. You wouldn't win really nothing. Yeah, if yeah. you get, also, if you get, if you had a problem with your Apple phone. Yeah. So from there, I can't think of it, where's my phone? We're recording about it. Yeah. Um, if you had a problem with the Apple phone, you wouldn't ring up. Yeah, actually, you wouldn't ring up Steve Jobs because he's dead. But you wouldn't ring up the CEO of Apple and, and tell him. But why, if you've got a small business, people call the CEO directly for customer problems. That's not empowering your team at all, is it? Your team should be able to deal with everything and then you're the exception on the escalation point. You should not be the default person that people call with problems. That's how to give yourself a nervous breakdown if you're growing your business and having more and more customers. So customers aren't number one, Training your employees is the number one priority so that they can deal with your customers who are the number one priority after your employees, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, really important thing. Um, I actually photocopied some little lists because there's some key things. His, his apology letter to his company is something so that's to behold. Really what, why did he write an apology letter to his company? For not doing his job as a CEO. He apologised to his whole company. Yeah, he said, I am sorry for tolerating a really bad culture within this company. It's kind of a master apology. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't pick up on it. I'm sorry I didn't train you better. I'm sorry I didn't put procedures in place. And this is a valid apology that most business owners have to say to their teams. Yeah. We've gone to the wall because I wasn't looking at the figures. I wasn't dealing with the software. Case principle. Yeah, it's not the company's fault, it's mine. Yeah, it's actually, it is your fault. It is. As the, the, yeah, yeah, it's the owner. Yeah. He's, He's not, not the responsible for the whole thing. Right. And really, if you're employed, you, so business is a, there's a lot of mirrors in business. One of the mirrors is if you've got a, a team that's performing crap, yeah, you don't need to look any further than the training, the guidance, the help, the induction, all the things that you aren't giving them as a business owner or a, or a business leader. And I've seen this so much in corporations. There's a massive amount of stuff that business leaders just don't do. And it's quite scary. Um, I did, um, have you heard of Siegel Management? Siegel Management. So it's a great philosophy. You've probably come across this. Siegel Management is a someone who's disconnected from reality. Okay, This is a business owner who never talks to the team, manages by abdication, chucks everything at them, expects them to get on with it. And then when they can't, what the single manager does, the single leader, is he, he swoops in, shits over everything, <laughs> steals the chips, yeah, leaves confusion, and then woof, straight out of there. That is terrible management and leadership, and it happens all the time. I've done it myself. You think 
you, you think you're helping, what you're actually doing is you're, just, you're causing fusion, you're flapping about, you're taking responsibility away from people, and you're just you're, you're crapping everywhere. And then you, you leave them to get on with it and just create more rubbish. So that's one so form of I'm going to call yo yo, where you just go in, cause chaos, and come back again. It's going to smack people in the name of yo yo. I like that one. Yeah. It's a yo yo. The house trick on us. On an elastic band. Bungee rope. On a bungee rope. Let's try it. Bungee management. Bungee management. Nice to meet everybody. Hey, where is it? Go. I remember that one. So another great form of management is follow the ball management. Have you come across that? Follow the ball. This is great. When my son was 11, he was a member, he was a part of a, uh, a rugby team, okay? and he's really keen on rugby, he thought it was brilliant. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen an 11 year old rugby team, right? <laughs> what they do is they don't work as a team, they don't get the concept of passing and different positions in the team. What they do is Every single one of them runs after the ball. <laughs> they all run after the ball. Oh, there's the ball. Oh, <laughs> I've been in programs of work, multi-million pound programs, where the program managers have done follow the ball leadership. And we should not do this in our teams anywhere. In our businesses, in our teams. And what it is, is there's a customer problem Get everybody trying to sort that customer problem out. Yeah. Everything and else goes to the wall. Everything else is just forgotten. There's no roles and responsibilities and defined boundaries or, or defined places where people hand stuff over. It's all go for the source problem and put every resource you possibly can on this massive I've issue. I've seen 16 people doesn't work. editing a Google Docs because it had, a proposal had to go out the door within 12 Hours. And what was this? That's the problem. That's the problem. What's the symptom? <laughs> <laughs> the symptom was that you planned that this was so the That's a symptom. That's a symptom. The problem was. <laughs> it's not a symptom. I've got to The problem was. The problem was. The plan of lack of planning. The lack, lack of planning that a proposal had to be ready by a certain date. And you take that, you take that back a bit. What's the yeah. problem? The real problem is. The real problem. Um, so the problem, yeah. okay, so you've got the symptom. Yeah. It should have been written, reviewed, refined, and then submitted. And but the reviewer came in and changed everything. Okay. Um, therefore, suddenly, the whole document needs to be rewritten within 12 hours. And I've, I've never seen anything like it. No, the, the cursor's moving up and down, and people editing stuff. Could it have been prevented? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of these things are they, they, they've learned. They've, they've actually learned. So I think the, I could go, I've, I've got pages of notes. Because it's, could there's, there's, it's there's just, 55 chapters, and I every, every one of them is I made a gold notes. Mine. I made notes in the first 62 pages. Well, what you've talked about here tonight is only the first 62 pages that I made notes. I've listened to the whole thing. But when I was making notes, I had the book in front of me making sure I wanted to cover certain things. So, I think the whole crux of it is listen, <laughs> listen to the book or read the book. You can read the book it's better. You're the only one with a copy of the book. Right? <laughs> You're the only one with a copy of the book. You lucky person. Oh. Um, but you can't read it. Listen to it. It wasn't boring. You're ready. No, I'm getting it on all the books. Anyone wants to? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 because to. you'll have a Monica Walker and you'll just underline every yeah, line. Yeah, it's going to be horrible. Trying to get back to it. You can't. There's no way of putting bookmarks in and yeah. making notes and coming back to it. So you can buy it. Fantastic. Well, I can imagine doing like what I need to do is because uh, he's having a listen to it in the car and he's going along. Uh, having a listen to it and the then going back. Yes. Because yeah. there'll be things that trigger in your mind when you listen I, to I need the hard copy. The moment I start listening, I'm like, I'm like, like chapter 15, I'm going, I just need this because I need to just keep visiting it almost monthly yeah. to spot what's missing from my there's control in there. there. But there's a lot, there's, it's so valuable. And it's everything I've been talking to you about on the Pop and Look at Right Road. Yeah. Go, go ahead, buddy, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're a star, you're on my... Like, my guy. Hello. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> our favourite so man. Yeah, <laughs> um, We're advertising the venue as well for you. We have actually yeah. done, oh, done yeah. product yeah. placement yeah. as well, which is really good. So, so I've advertised yeah. myself. Yeah. 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 This is great. Yeah. Yeah. Tell your boss you're yeah. 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 doing their social media for them. Kieran Evans, I'm here. There you go.
you probably ought to be added by Alfred. <laughs> um, so I think the cr crunch of it is though, think. Yeah. Think. Take Spend time. Take, 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 take time to think about the business. Whether it's that you're an employee or a business owner, think. Don't just react. Proact. And cool. that's what we're going to lead on tonight. Thanks so much for watching, all three of you who tuned in. Um, I hope you heard it, because it's quite a busy bar tonight, wasn't it? Yeah. So, you just must finish there, Did you see that? Yeah. Right, so, and then you don't do that.